a teacher, I became a counselor and became more and more aware of, of labels and things, which isn't important, but the, um, that feeling is there. And for me, it's always been the sense of perfectionism. I mean, I remember this, this thing when I was in kindergarten, I got a frowny face on an assignment because I did it wrong and it followed the directions. And I tell you too, that felt like the end of the world and it kind of set up this whole thing of, of needing to do everything right and never make a mistake and be perfect. And it just has kind of snowballed and it became you know, social anxiety because those, those interactions. So I've had my own personal experiences. Plus I was in a car accident. I had a traumatic brain injury and, and some of the chemistry and the reactions that was going on there made it worse. So, and, and anxiety actually has, has kind of over time built up and led to some digestive health issues and, and kind of caused my own uh, immune system. I have some autoimmune disorders and they, a lot of them are rooted in anxiety actually. Uh, so I, I know the impact that it can have on people. But also, I can tell you, I can sit here and say, I've experienced all this, I've always been this perfectionist and had social anxiety and, and have had these, you know, just, just kind of uptight. Yeah, I know I had a counselor once tell me I had an anxious personality. And I thought, what? No, I don't. And then I thought, wait a minute. Yes, I do. And so I've worked on it. And everything that I write, and I'm not, I'm not plugging my books, but I, I've got them back here and, and this, this new one, I write articles. Everything is stuff that I draw on from my professional background and my own personal experience. And I think if I met that, that therapist who said, you have an anxious personality, and she wasn't being mean, it was just an observation as we were talking, it was actually really helpful. It was one of the most helpful things somebody has said to me, really. And I think if I met her today for the first time, I don't think she, I know, she would never make that observation. I don't feel like I, I have that, that tendency anymore. Anxiety does pop up for all of us all the time. But the key, and that's what I'm hoping to talk about here, is that it, it doesn't have to rule us. It doesn't have to limit us. Even right now with all of this coronavirus and this panic and this unknown and, and this great fear, some of it which is very, very, very real and some of it is imagined and blown out of proportion because of all the things we're hearing. But even, even with that, you can be calm and override that because there's anxiety and then there's there's you and all of the perspectives that you have and the things that you have around you and within you that are a lot stronger than anxiety so that's kind of my message you can live well despite that and so if you have questions today or Roxanne I know that you've got things we'll kind of go through and have a conversation but but yeah I mean, anxiety does not have to dominate. It's very real and it's something, and if I can sit there, somebody who, who flipped out at age five because she got a frowny face on a worksheet, all the way through a therapist saying, oh, you know, you've got kind of an anxious personality. And I thought, no, I don't, yes, I do. And you know, all of that, if I can come here and feel at peace all the time, well, no, that's not realistic. Nobody feels peace all the time. But if I can bring myself back to that feeling of peace over and over, Everybody can, even right now with all this anxiety going around with the coronavirus. Okay, so I have lived with anxiety a lot as well. I think different people, for different people, it trig different things trigger it. For some, it's social anxiety. For some, it might be professional anxiety. For some, it might be just worry about, and your mind goes to worst case scenario. I recognize it a lot in others because I've experienced it so much. I know that we, so many of us try to hide it and squelch it down. I talk to some people and, what, and they may sound like almost out of breath a little to me and other people wouldn't notice, but I could notice because I've lived it and I've tried to hide my own anxiety. So let's just start with today and where we are. Um, when our mind goes to worst case scenario right now with fear, I think that the hardest thing about right now is we may begin with, we may already have faced anxiety and live with it, but today is making it worse, I think, because there's no definition, there's no clear cut boundaries for the future for this. Like, are we going to be living in for a week or two weeks or a month or two months. So like when our mind goes to worst case scenario in a situation, whether it's COVID-19 or talking to our boss 
or talking to a cute guy that we're nervous about or a cute girl that we're nervous about, when our mind goes to that worst case scenario, and I think a lot of our anxiety is worry of what if, what if, what if, what would you say to people? How do we start addressing that? How do we calm ourselves when it's so like instantaneous, we go to a place of anxiety? So how, what, how do we intervene with ourselves? Oh my gosh, that is so good. You just, you just covered so much and that, that you said it so well. And I know my mind is going, oh, I want to say this and this and this and this. So let me just kind of rein it in and, and build on some of the things you said. So first of all, that whole unknown, it's actually, there's an official thing for that. It's called um, intolerance of uncertainty or uncertainty intolerance. And it's just, yeah, as, as humans, one of our greatest strengths and one of our greatest laws, things that works against us is that, that needing to know, you know, we, we don't like the unknown. And right now, everything is unknown from, okay, I need toilet paper. That seems to be a big one. I'm starting to run. Am I going to find that in the store? And then it's, oh, should I even go to the store? You know, what, you know, what if, you know, who, what if somebody is there that has been exposed? And then it just goes on and on and spirals just way, way, way out of control. So the first step is actually awareness of yourself more so even first than, than what's going on around that'll come later. But you had said, I love this, that you talk to people and, and you notice that they're almost out of breath and they don't even realize it. And that is one of the first physical, physical manifestations of anxiety. One of the first signs, our bodies are always telling us all sorts of things, but we're not very good at listening to our body. We just don't. We have our mind, we have our body, and our body seems to be something that just gets in the way. And we notice it once stuff starts screaming at us because it's out of control, but we don't notice the subtle little things like maybe we're not breathing correctly, not breathing deeply enough. And so we seem a little out of breath. So the first thing is to start to tune in and notice that. Notice your breath. That's the first basic thing. And just pause and take a deep breath in, hold it for a few seconds, and then let it go. In yoga, they even let it out with, a, with a, an audible noise so you kind of can hear it just. <sighs> Thich Nhat Hanh is a Buddhist monk and uh, a prolific writer, and he has helped people a lot, but one, his, his big thing is the breath. And he'll tell people, when you notice you're anxious, bring it to the moment, you just say, this is my in-breath, and this is my out breath. Because really it's that breath that's the foundation of life and that's the main thing we have control over. And that breath also it sets our whole body in motion. It's not just our lungs. So it provides the brain and the entire body with oxygen and it affects your nervous system. So when you're anxious and worried about, okay, what if, what if I run out of food what if I run out of toilet paper? What if I lose my job? And, you know, and, and what if I went to the mailbox and my neighbor was there, my neighbor had coronavirus and I've been exposed. Just what if, what if, what if? That kicks in that fight or flight system in your body. You actually have a physical reaction to your thoughts. So the thoughts aren't always based in reality, but they're very substantial. And we'll have a a physiological reaction. It kicks in the, the nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system, which is it, rate, it increases your heart rate. It slows your breathing. It actually doesn't slow it. I'm sorry. It says the opposite. It makes it shallow is what I meant to say. It makes it shallow. It makes it rapid. So you've got that short of breath sensation and it can make you dizzy. It diverts oxygen you know, it gets into, from your core into your muscles to prepare you for fight or flight. So you can get all sorts of nausea, you can get dizziness, just from your thoughts, just from those what ifs that kicks in. But you start to breathe and it calms down. It kicks in the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the nervous system that stops. Some people call it the rest and digest nervous system. You got fight or flight and rest and digest. But you wanna breathe and you wanna kick in 
that rest and digest. It floods the brain with oxygen. It slows the production of cortisol, the stress hormone, and adrenaline, and norepinephrine. Those are all stress hormones that get going. And what's happening right now is our stress hormones are in overdrive. We are in, as a society, we are in fight or flight mode. We are in overdrive and we are flooding ourselves with these hormones and we can't calm down because of it. So we've got to step in and override that. And it starts with the breath. And that is even more important than trying to deal with the uncertainty. And that comes next. But I feel like I've been talking a lot. So I wanted to see if somebody has questions or if Roxanne, if you want to kind of jump in and fill in or. You so know, you know, I've you heard that a lot about the breath and maybe we could try a breathing exercise. But for me, it doesn't stop the thoughts. Right. I mean, even as I'm breathing, the thoughts are when I'm in the situation that triggers my anxiety, the thoughts are worst case scenario. Yep. non-stop oh my god 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 <laughs> so like even the even if i calm my breath how do we calm our brains right from those constant thoughts and they may be negative thoughts we hold about ourselves mm -hmm. they may be they may be about ourselves they may be about the situation they may be what we can't control well they're typically what we can't control they're typically based on untrue beliefs that we know are untrue or that we know are unlikely, but we still hold these beliefs. So, so after the breath or while we're doing the breath work, how do we calm our minds? Okay. That is, you know, again, there, there's anxiety right there. Those, those thoughts, those emotions. So the breath is always key. Always come to your breath. Even if for a moment you don't think you're being anxious, tune into your breath keep yourself calm. You should just get in the habit of slow, deep, rhythmic breathing. Then that's the, that's the foundation, but obviously that does not end the anxious thoughts. And I have bad news and I have good news. So I'm always one that, that likes to hear the bad news first so I can deal with it. And then, and then the good news is just icing on the cake, but they, they relate here. So the bad news is there's so much that's out of our control. We have that uncertainty and tolerance, and we have things going on, whether it's in your daily life having nothing to do with COVID-19, or it's everything to do with COVID-19. No matter what the content of those thoughts are, there's things that we can't control. So trying to impose our own worries on them to try, we can't worry our way into making something better. So what we have to do, a good thing that works is shifting the perspective and truly working on the thoughts. There are exercises that you can do. So again, so part of that bad news is we can't control the outside and sometimes those anxious thoughts are gonna keep coming. I feel like I have a great handle on my anxiety now, but I still have anxious thoughts. It's just the difference is I've learned how to not buy into them. I recognize, okay, this is a thought. So there are a few different, actually quick, little exercises you can do in the moment. And it all involves separating yourself. So you've got your anxious thoughts here and then you have you and they're, they're separate. So you want to kind of put something, put some space between that. So you're worried, you know, what if this, what if that, you know, what this worst case scenario, breathe. And then the first distance is something very simple. It takes you have to do it over and over and over again because it doesn't automatically click, but it change it to, okay, I'm worried. I might, I might get sick. I might get this virus. Distance yourself with, okay, wait a minute. I might, and I might not. I am just having the thought that I'm worried about the virus. I'm just having the thought that this bad thing is going to happen. Now the thought doesn't go away yet but it gives yourself a little bit of distance in that. It's just, I'm having the thought. Again, in that space helps. Then there are, there are next steps. You continue accepting it rather than fighting it. I have a little visual and I've used it before. So if you've seen, uh, I think I've used it on a healthy place video and I've, I've written about it. So if you've seen this, you, you know what it is, but if you haven't seen it, I'll show you. So this is one of those, okay, those, Finger traps, those little, little toy things that if you stick your, and it represents anxiety and our anxious thoughts. And if you stick your fingers in there and then try to quickly pull it out, you, you, you can't. 
because whoops, I almost broke it because you're struggling against it. I pulled a little bit too hard. Good thing my son has another one. So if you're fighting and struggling and you're stuck in these thoughts and all you're thinking about is these thoughts, you're not going to get out. You need that distance that I'm having a thought that and just accept that they're there rather than fighting. And then you can relax. And by accepting it and relaxing, you can pull yourself out. But it is that, that real, I'm having the thought that I'm not trapped in it. This isn't real. It's just a thought. And you can breathe and let it go. And it has to be done repetitively you know, over and over. Because right now, those anxious thoughts are strong. And they're there. And they're hard to get past. But so you've got the breathing. You've got just accepting them and letting them be. Separating yourself. I think it's just a thought. Because you can also throw in other things. Well, it's a thought that, hey, I might, you, know, do, you can be outlandish with this, come up with other possibilities. So I might go to the mailbox and my neighbor's there and I've got, I just got exposed to coronavirus and, and now I'm going to be very sick and I'm going to expose my loved ones who also are going to get very sick. Possibility. Or maybe, maybe that neighbor isn't sick and we just had a very pleasant exchange and now we can both go on our way. So that's a possibility. Imagine all sorts of, when you use that, those what ifs that anxiety likes to play on you, use them to your advantage. Well, what if that neighbor, okay, say what if I mentioned one of my books to that neighbor and that neighbor happens to have, just be best buddies with some gigantic agent of the world who they're going to know, tell them about my book. And now I'm going to become a multi-trillionaire because, because I, I just talked to this neighbor. So, which obviously is outlandish. It's not any less realistic though than our anxious what ifs. So play that what if when you catch yourself, what if this, I'm worried about this, pop in other things, some from the outlandish to the realistic. Well, what if this happens? Well, what if this good thing happens? What if? There's not just negative what ifs. There's also positive what ifs. So play with that. Catch your thoughts, accept them, distance yourself, and then play the what if game right back to anxiety and change it and mix it up. And by the end, you will have solved nothing other than calming down and relaxing and saying, okay, these are all just anxious thoughts. Anything's a possibility. I don't know. And you know what? That's okay. Those are all just so, and I, I have more, but again, I'd like to, I'd like to pause and give you a chance, Roxanne, to, to chime in and ask and share your own thoughts. Okay. So if anyone has anything to say, feel free to post it in the chat box. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this. So one ther a therapist that I went to once said to me to think, is it, a pos is it at all a possibility that your belief is not fact? Right. And that's basically what you're saying. So we yeah. take these negative beliefs to, we react as if our negative beliefs are 100% true, 100% right. accurate, right? And then we yeah. react. Just so because we we think them, they're, they're obviously true, right? This is, right. is what our thoughts are. So we think, okay, I'm going to go to my mailbox and get coronavirus if a neighbor is out there. So what you're saying is, think of other possibilities. So yeah. thinking about other possibilities, we show that there is at least a 1% chance our beliefs are not true, are not fact, yeah. right? And if there's right. a 1% chance, there's a 5% chance they, they, I mean, if there's any percent chance that our beliefs are not true, then you can't take them as 100% fact. Right, exactly. So we're trying to disprove, we're trying to get our brain to consider that this is not absolute and that there's other possibilities for our beliefs. Exactly. In fact, that, that notion is, is well-researched and, and you know, proven to be an effective technique because it actually works because our, that's true. Our thoughts aren't completely accurate. It comes from cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which I like a lot of components. I think by itself, it is, it is missing some things, but it has some really good things too, like that, like countering those. Uh, in this, in 101 ways, here's, here's an example of what you could do to get it out of your head, because sometimes 
you know, th then you just end up with lots rolling around in your head and it's hard to look at objectively. You can make a chart that looks something like that. So at the top, you put your worry, you put your what if, or you put a label about yourself. If you keep telling yourself, I'm, I'm stupid or I'm ridiculous or, you know, I, I do everything wrong. You, you, anything, a label, a worry, a what if. You put that down in a box and you can have this for space in the book. This just has one example, but you can make your list long. You, you put down your thought and then in the next one, you could, you look for, uh, it says a positive label that counters the negative one. So this one's dealing with labels, but you look for other, other facts, other thoughts. Okay. I saw my neighbor and now I'm dead. Yeah, I got coronavirus. Okay. What else? Those what ifs that I said, come up with different possibilities, write them down beside it in another box. Then to reinforce it further, because the mind, <laughs> The mind is, is so two-faced. It wants proof for everything, but yet it'll believe every anxious thought that, that comes in that there's no proof for. So that's something to override as well. So you put then in your third box, your last box, evidence, real evidence. Well, okay, I talked to my, for me, my husband is out and about. He goes out every day to work. He's considered so far an essential, an essential industry. So he's there, they're taking lots of precautions, but he's coming and going and I haven't gotten sick and he hasn't gotten sick and it's okay. So I put that in my third column, my evidence. Well, it's not just my neighbor. I have lots of people that I've indirectly been exposed to. So you know what, so far I'm fine. And then you just keep going with that. You write down your worry or your what if or your label against yourself that you're, you're being hard on yourself for. Alternate possibilities and then some evidence to show, hey, look, there are some other realistic possibilities out there. I see them and I live them every day. That's great advice. So you're, dis, you're, you're trying to disprove the belief and show that there's evidence to support that it's a possibility that your belief is wrong. Right. And that something else is true. Right. Now, to help support that, are there visualization exercises? Because I think visualization could be so helpful. Where does, does, is there visualization that comes into play? And is there anything you could give as an example? Absolutely. Okay, I love visualization. If I could turn the computer with not knocking, without knocking everything over, I would do it. But you can believe me. So I have these cork boards above my desk and I pin lots of different things on them. And to outsiders, it just looks like a mess. But all of the things are meaningful to me. And there are things that I will look at and I can remind there's values up there. There's my goals. There's little messages of encouragement. There's humor, you know, which is good to pepper in, but they're visual reminders for me. And I will look at those. And it actually came from when I was young. My mom used to put little positive sayings all over the place. And I did that here too. My kids were growing up and I think you know, I had a board in our living room that I put a saying on. I'm getting a little off track. I'll get back onto visualization here. It does really. So these sayings, and, and I think my daughter liked them. She humored me, but I stopped doing it right now because my son informed me that, they're, that it drives him crazy. So I find whatever. He's 18. He's a boy. Yeah, fine. They drive him crazy. So I don't put them in his face, but I still have them for me. You know, my little sayings or my little pictures. And seeing that will reset my thoughts and my emotions and it triggers there's some again and i'll look at these and some of them are visual i have a picture of uh, there's there's mountains and a campfire I'm, I'm one of mine and i like that to me that's very relaxing so i will breathe i'll often just close my eyes for 15 seconds and call that to mind you visualize something that you find pleasant and calming uh, in, in a story that I wrote, one of my, my novels, uh, this guy has social anxiety and he's very uptight and he's a, he's a school janitor and he goes into his, his room with all the HVAC equipment and all, everything and it instantly reminds him, he also likes the outdoors, he likes to camp. And he uses that to visualize a calming scene. The, the, the rushing water reminds him of the, you know, the waterfall. So he will visualize it and he'll pick, you visualize the sounds too, which seems weird because sounds are hearing, but pick an image 
a scene, a setting, something that makes you peaceful. And you can use it no matter where you are. This guy in the story used it at work and he was still uptight and those, the anxiety was still, the things that made him anxious were still there, but he used the power of his mind, that visualization to calm down so he could deal with it. There's also apps. I have one. I don't know how well it's going to show up, but it's called, um, and I don't have any stake in this app, by the way, but it, it's, so I'm not promoting it, but it's called, uh, if you can see it, subliminal vision boards. Oh, I love it. And that. oh, it's so cool. I just love it. it there is this, I, I prefer free apps. This one I do have to subscribe to, but it's $2 a month. It's $24 a year. I mean, that is, or yeah, yes. Sorry, math. Two dollars a month, twenty-four dollars a year. To me, that's a good investment. I'd rather have that than a latte every week from the local co coffee place. To me, I, this is a better way to spend my money. And I can put in. I can make my own. You customize it. You put in a scene that's meaningful. You put in a background. You can put in pictures. You can put in text. And then you look at this. You can put in music if you want to, and it plays. And I will take breaks during the day. They're uh, five or ten minute well, five, and then you can do it twice. You can extend it. Little breaks to visualize, and I will look at it, and I'll play the music, and it reminds me uh, that I have one for health. I have one for anxiety and stress. I have one specifically dealing with perfectionism. I have one to remind me of why I do what I do, you know, my values. You can make endless, and it, it helps you visualize, and that is enough for me. That's one of my powerful tools to de-stress. If you don't like an app or you're not, you, know, you don't have a phone that gets the apps, find a picture, any picture. Close your eyes and remember a favorite place that you've been. And you can be mindful of it, even though you're not physically there right now. What do you see? Everything. Be detailed as you conjure up this picture. What do you see? What does it sound like? What does the air feel like on your skin? Is there, are you outside? Is there a breeze that you can feel gently blowing? If, uh, are there smells in this area? Are you maybe in a bakery? Maybe you loved going to a bakery with your grandparents when you were little and you could bring that to your mind and you can you know, smell those smells and it redirects your thoughts. Again, that kicks that parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest one. It just overrides the anxious nervous system visualization is so powerful and you can do it anytime, any place. And it just rains things in and with, with everything else, it doesn't change anything around you that you can't control, but it brings you, your own self back under your control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come on a second here. So I, I think, um, I think visualization is incredibly powerful too. And I personally have, for those of you who don't know, but I've battled a lot of illness in my life. I have lupus. I was diagnosed when I was 15. I've had two kidney transplants and lymphoma. So wow. just to be alive, yeah. it's like, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a miracle, really, knock on wood. So one thing I've done in my life that I feel has helped is, um, and I have something, I have a quote that I have hung up on my desk too, but one thing I do is I take my absolute goal or like a vision of my goal. So right now during COVID-19, my goal is to dance on the beach. I want to go back. I love the beach. It's my happy place. And I want to be able to go outside and go to the beach as a sun setting and just like be free again, right? We're all so trapped in here. Yes. So right now my goal is to go to the beach and just be free to like jump in the waves and whatever. So I'll put up a picture of the beach. Now every, I may not know how or when or if, or whatever, but I leave that pathway open and flexible for the universe to figure out for me, but I just stay determined, focused on my absolute goal. Because yes. every, all these thoughts will come in, well, I don't know if that's possible, and when are we gonna be let out? It may not be till fall when the nice weather is over, but I don't 
I try not to go to the how, I go to the where, I go to the destination. Yes. So, and even, you know, my anxiety was a lot social and especially with guys because um, I had been sick during my teenage years and I was on dialysis machines and all that. And I thought, who's gonna, I thought, will I ever meet the right guy? So I would have a picture of a wedding. And again, I thought, you know, reality says, well, who's gonna, who's gonna wanna go out with me after all this or whatever. And I tried not to let it get there, just stay focused on my vision and then let the universe find that, fill in those unknowns for me, let life fill in the unknowns because life is amazing. Whether we're in this situation right now that's difficult that we didn't imagine, but sometimes life swings the opposite direction, gives us a good situation that we would never imagine, right? So I forget, so you don't always have to figure out the details of how, just be aware of what your dreams are and put up those pictures of your absolute goals and dreams and then believe or put out their positive energy that the universe will help you get to your dreams whether it's a flourishing business or whether it's a flourishing relationship or whether it's flourishing health um if you could focus on the destination and not and when those thoughts come in Oh, I'm not sure if you'll get there. Oh, this could never happen. Just stay focused on your destination and and trust that you'll be guided to that destination. And that has helped me con does help me survive. Because at my worst times when the doctor said to me, You may not live, you may not get through this, you may not be able to walk again, all the negative messages I've heard in my life, I pictured myself running or I pictured myself dancing. Again, for me it's usually on the beach because that makes me happy. But and the dream may not come true exactly how you picture, like I'm wearing sun protective clothing while I'm dancing. Because <laughs> we just live this can't go to the sun. So that wasn't part of my dream picture, but I'm still <laughs> dancing on the beach. Right. So, <laughs> and it's, it's still, and that goes, so you don't judge your dreams either. They'll say, well, if I can't have it perfectly like this, if I have to wear protective sun gear head to toe while I dance on the beach, you know what? They're still dancing on the beach. I'm so still it, dancing on the beach. And right. then during, the, when those dreams come to reality, and they often do, even despite right. what other people say or what you might think, if you hold on to those destinations, when they do happen, it's really important that you celebrate them. So yes. like, dance yeah. with all your might. And when you get out of the house, which we all will when this COVID thing mm -hmm. is over, celebrate. And what right. happens is, it infuses you with gratitude and that helps you live, appreciate even more and live an even deeper sense of life. That's what I've learned. Oh, absolutely. That is so, I mean, there's so, so much science behind it and, and non-science. I mean, just, just knowing, I mean, again, those, those, those boards, the visualization of the beach, it does, it does something really powerful. It's not just fruit, fruit. you know, sometimes, it's tempting to, you know, you hear this and you think, well, how is that going to help my anxiety? No, no, no. I want, I want you to tell me right now, I want practical steps so that I can take A, B, C, and then my anxiety is gone. But it's, it doesn't, that's part of that bad news again. It doesn't work that way, but it works very powerfully through having our goals, our dreams, our visions, our purpose. Why, why do we want to do what we want to do? And that makes us what that does actually, even though the vision is for the future, you know, the, you know, in, you know, this is what I want. This is why I'm, I'm going. And I know this is going to happen someday. I can't dance on the beach now without getting, at least in the state of Oregon. Uh, right now, as of yesterday, we'd get a um, misdemeanor. To, we, it's a class C misdemeanor to be wow. out doing that stuff here. But, uh, well, that's because California and Washington are doing it and we do everything our neighbors do. It's just, yeah. So, um, but they've got a lot of cases and we don't. So, you know, whatever, that's fine. But okay, fine. I don't want to get a misdemeanor, so I'm not going to do it now, but I'm going to visualize it because I know I will. And what that does, first of all, this, it, it refocuses you. It's actually doing that ironically as a form of mindfulness, which is living in your moment. Yes, your dream is in the future, but you're seeing it now and you're visualizing it now and you're paying attention 
this is what it's going to feel like. This is what it's going to look like. This is how, you know, my hands are going to sense it. This, I'm going to hear the waves when I'm dancing and I'm either going to use the waves as my music or I'm going to put on my own music. But you, your mind, again, that power, that's what your mind is living now instead of the worries and the fears and the what ifs. It's just shifting your thoughts and your attention. And then I love that you mentioned celebrating. I'm big on that. I, I wrote it, um, uh, I've written about it and, and I have it coming up in a, in a new book that I was working on, but I can't say about that. But yeah, I talk about celebrating. Uh, I actually, this is funny. I actually bought a car uh, in January, just, just a modest, one but for me it was a symbol of i can i can do this i can i can get rid of my 13 year old vehicle that i keep having to call a tow truck to jump you know I, so i had to do it but i could and i celebrated and i actually named my car cella for celebrate <laughs> <laughs> because every time i see it it's like yes it's just this feeling of, it's just this good feeling this grateful feeling that i could do it right. and celebrating in your mind we talk about how breathing stimulates your 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 system mm -hmm. so to celebrate Celebrating, it actually releases dopamine in your brain. When you celebrate or you visualize and you're even thinking about that joy, you're releasing dopamine, which is a feel good hormone neurotransmitter that overrides that chemical anxiety that's in there. So, really, really powerful stuff. Yeah, I, I believe it. So, we get so stuck in the little details of the here and now and present and today, right? And I do right. believe you have to take one step at a time but keep that dream of the future. And if you trust that, if you plant that seed firmly for the future, all these little details, as they come up, just keep that vision for the future in mind. And right. I feel like somehow you'll be provided a way. Mm -hmm. So my social anxiety, like I said, lied a lot. My anxiety lied a lot with social and especially with guys. Well, knock on wood, now I've been married for 15 years. So oh, congratulations. And I thought I would <laughs> never meet the right person and all that. And I did meet him when I was older. But, um, you know, I just, I just believe in that visualization really strongly. So, um, so just, so even as we go through this COVID-19, put your dreams up and keep them firmly in your mind, whatever your dream image is, if it's going to Hawaii or if it's going wherever, that's really helpful. Any other, could you guide us through a quick breathing exercise or any exercise that you feel would be helpful right now for those who are on the call who are living with anxiety? Absolutely. So breathing, yeah, the, there's different, there's lots of different ways to breathe, basically. The key is you, you want to breathe deep, deep into your belly. So if you, I'll stand up and you can't see it, but if you put your hands actually on your stomach, and you may have heard this before, I'm straddling a chair, so it looks probably weird. So you, you put your hands you know, here, and when you breathe, you want your hands to go out as, as much as they can. It can, but you don't want to breathe up here in your chest. You want to breathe it down. Use hands up. Visualize blowing a feather or blowing bubbles. In fact, you could actually blow bubbles. I should have brought some in because I have some other, other props too. I should have brought bubbles. If you are blowing bubbles, first of all, it's fun. You're letting go. It's going to be hard not to laugh. You can even dance in the bubbles or try to play games and try to pop them. But to blow a bubble correctly, if you have a bubble wand, so we're going to visualize here because I didn't bring mine in from the garage. So if you have, you, know, you visualize your bubble wand, and you're gonna use this to practice deep breathing, if you blow on it really hard, what does that do? It just makes the soap stuff drip down and you don't get any bubbles. It just makes a sticky, gooey mess. And then you're stuck to your thoughts again. Think of those as your anxious thoughts and you're just blowing them all over the place. So to breathe, you breathe deeply, you hold it to get set, and then you gently, and slowly let it go. So visualize blowing bubbles in and then out. And those bubbles are just, just releasing out slowly. And you can do this for 15 seconds, for 20 seconds. Uh, you can take a break for five minutes and just breathe. And what's great about it is if you're a little self-conscious, nobody has to know that you're doing it. So you don't have to actually have a jar of bubbles and you don't have to go like this because then you'd be like, okay, what are you doing? But you just breathe in, inhale, 
hold for a few counts and then out. I had a woman that I used to give presentations with in a health class at a high school. And she had learned this from, from somebody else, a breathing thing. And she taught it to, you know, she led students through it. You know, they can even have their hand under their desk. If you're at work and you're at a desk, you, you know, your hands are down or whatever. You can use your fingers for a rhythmic breathing. You breathe in when you're going up and you pause at the top of your finger and then breathe out. And then you breathe in. and you just keep going. It's a good, you don't always have to do that, but it's a good visual. It's really good timing to time that inhale and the pause and the exhale. And you can make your movement as slow or as fast as you want to kind of accommodate your own unique breath. But again, the bubbles, the finger exercises, or simply just lying down or sitting down with your hands on your belly and, and picturing it Fill and then release. I mentioned Tich Nahan earlier in his, I mean, everything with him starts with the breath. Everything is about the breath and rightly so. I mean, it seems too simple and people say, it's dumb, but it, it really does work. And he will tell people to you know, just say, this is my inhale or my in-breath. This is my exhale. And what that does is distract you from your anxious thoughts, because instead of you those worries, you're thinking, this is my in-breath, this is my out-breath. That's all you're thinking about. And when the thoughts come in when you're doing that, because they will, breathing exercise, mindfulness, meditation, none of that is to get rid of the anxious thoughts. It's to change your relationship with them so they don't control you. So when the thoughts come in when you're doing your breathing, just keep breathing and just let them drift. If you're blowing bubbles, picture them blowing away on a bubble or floating away on a cloud. They're just going through. You don't have to get tangled. You don't have to, one of my things in here is go fishing without a hook. And it's about not getting hooked on stuff. And that breathing and letting go is very, very helpful with that. So are those- Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, so we could use that Anytime. I love the hand, what you just did with, I've never seen that before. There's a few things you did that I haven't seen before with the finger touch, finger pull too. Um, before we end, I just want to bring it back full circle. So someone just commented and she wrote when I wake up, so just bring this full circle to today, to right now, to what we could do when we hang up. When I wake up in the morning, every morning, the pandemic issue hits me right in the face. It is like before I even have the chance, the thoughts are already there. Was I dreaming about it? I don't know. It feels like I'm fighting a bully before I even have a chance to get up. I like that. By the way, everything you're talking about is making perfect sense, but right now it seems so hard. My one bright light has been my grandson, soon to be four. Now we are isolated for safety's sake from him and my son. It's heartbreaking, and I think about when I will see him next. Anxiety says, is he even going to remember you and the bond you have? So we do try to FaceTime frequently. Anything you could say to Anne? Oh, my gosh. So the, the capture, I like that fighting a bully image you know, before you even get out of bed because anxiety is a bully. And that, and that is the, the thoughts just, just attack. So one thing, and actually... It's ironic, I'm gonna mention it even though this is my topic. I, today, later today, I'm writing my weekly article for Healthy Place. I write an anxiety to anxiety column on, the, on that website. And it's actually about gratitude. And okay, so I, this is something I do. And I do it lying in bed in the morning because a lot of times we do. Things just start and we wake up and it's almost like we've never gone to sleep. It's like you, you could be mid thought and you fall asleep. And the instant you realize you're awake, that thought is continuing. It's just, I mean, it, it, it's so common. So, Anne, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think a lot of people experience that. And especially now with, okay, what, what, is, what is today going to bring? Excuse me. So, one thing to do, Roxanne, you had mentioned gratitude earlier. I mean, gratitude, again, doesn't, doesn't erase this. It doesn't change. It doesn't take away anything that you're isolated from your grandson. But... What I will do is I lie there in bed before I get up and I turn anxious thoughts 
into grateful thoughts. So when that, when those thoughts start to come in right away, like, you know, is my grandson even going to remember me? And he definitely will, first of all, because he's four. So he, he's old enough. And you are FaceTiming. Um, you could even send him little, little letters or little coloring book things in the mail. In fact, one thing that might be that is kind of cute, you could do a collect a, a picture with him, like a, on a coloring book page or a printout from the computer. And you could color just a little bit of it and mail it to him. And then he can add his own and then he can mail it back to you. And then you could add, you know, you could do, or just a drawing on paper, just have a blank piece of paper and start something and you can, you can mail it back and forth. Uh, you know, if you can get to your mailbox, which, which hopefully you can get to your mailbox, but um, you know, that, that's a little doing little things like that keeps us in touch with each other. But as far as the thoughts early in the morning, so I will, okay, we'll use the coronavirus right now uh, is okay. What if for me, these, all these places that, that I write for, their advertisers have been pulling out. So their budget has changed. And so that means that my budget has changed. They're going to be giving me fewer assignments. So to be anxious about that, okay, fine, it's a legitimate thing, but the, the what ifs, you know, I can make all sorts of horrible situations from it, or I can make all sorts of funny ones or all sorts of good ones. But in, instead of trying to fight those when I'm lying in bed, I just think, okay, wait, I'm worried about this, but I'm also, in addition, fine, I accept that that worry is there and that the reality is there because I can't change that. But I'm grateful that I am lying in bed and able to think about income. You know, I still am going to have, I can still do some things. I can have it coming in. Uh, you know, I get some assignments. I can do other things to, to you know, I don't know, to, you know, I'm sorry, I'm babbling, writing for different places and, and having different things come in. So I'm grateful that I'm in that position. And I'm also grateful that, you know, when I think about it, it's not going to be a catastrophe. I don't, I live simply, I don't have all these extravagant spending plans. So I can tighten my belt and thank goodness I have a belt to tighten. And you want them to be realistic. They don't have to be fake gratitude. It's like, oh, I am so grateful that I have this hangnail because I can, you know, that I can feel it. And it reminds me that I don't have a broken thumb. I just have a hangnail. Uh, it doesn't have to be like that. That gives kind of, that's, that becomes insincere. And then your anxiety takes over because your brain isn't buying into that. But as you're like, okay, so you're worried about your, your grandson and, you know, him in, in not seeing him for a while, but you can say, wait, I still have that relationship with my grandson, I still get to FaceTime him. I'm grateful that I can FaceTime him. And I'm grateful that maybe I'll send these pictures back and forth. Uh, I'm grateful that, you know, I, I have this, this picture of him that I, can, that I can look at and see. It's kind of like the picture of the beach and the visualization, you have your grandson. And he can be a reminder of your, your purpose while you're putting up with all of this stuff right now, because it will get better. It, it just it hits bottom before it bounces back to getting better. But what else are you, are you grateful for? Uh, you know, are you, is your bed comfortable right now? Do you have something that you're looking forward to in the day? And if not, it's a good time to think, hey, what do I have to look forward to today? So again, let the, let the anxious thoughts drift by. Don't, don't, get, don't get stuck in them or keep thinking of them. Acknowledge them because they are real. You don't want to deny them either. I, I definitely would not say that we should all just pretend that we're not anxious, but accept it. And then replace the thought with gratitude, with a plan for the day, with something that you can send your grandson or some special joke that you want to tell him when you FaceTime him next. Just replace those anxious thoughts, let them drift, and then fill in with more positive thoughts, more positive, realistic ones as you're lying in bed. And as you're doing it, make sure you're breathing deeply too, because that again helps the brain and the body. So... Just, just some little thoughts of what you can do, you know, right there, just replacing the anxieties. Thank you. That's great. And Anne loves that idea of the coloring. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, it's, little things like that are, are just fun. And maybe it'll be a tradition that you do even when this is over. Yeah. Uh, but so another thing that is going to throw, it's not quite with the thoughts, with, but it is. Yeah, you know, we have anxiety. We are, we are one mind and body. People think of the mind, people think of the body, but we're actually all one. So that's why breathing is so effective. Deepak, Deepak Chopra calls it the body mind. 
So tending to your body during this time is also really important. Eating well, because there are foods and beverages that actually cause anxiety. And so eating, eating well, eating healthy food is going to help fuel you and keep you keep you in shape basically to ward off the anxious thoughts also stretching and yoga i have this this is what i ran to get before this is my prop so this is a nice and actually my daughter and her fiance a future son-in-law uh, got this for me at dave and buster's when we were there over christmas time this is yoga dice you don't have to have a dice you can, you can make your own or just draw write down some stretches and then draw one out of a hat but what i like to do throughout the day is i roll this and it'll come up on just a, a simple pose like ah, like crescent moon you know or or just you know sitting like this the namaste position you know the the ending and the beginning of yoga stretch stretch your body eat well drink lots of water all of those things are positive things you can do for both your mind and your body and when you stretch and eat and drink water it, it nourishes your body and brain it really is a way of beating anxiety i have one more thing if you want to see it but i don't know if we have time Yes, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So these, so I, again, I've, I've written, it's actually is, is in here too, or a, a variation of this. I have this little, it's a vase that I filled with big popsicle sticks. And I have this, I wear these bracelets. This one is called a pause bracelet. I have to replace the battery though, because it, it just, it just conked, but it, this will buzz once an hour. You can set your phone alarm. You can set any kind of timer or a Fitbit if you have that and you're getting hourly steps. Incorporate this periodically throughout your day. Pause. And I have these. I will draw one of these. It's my, it's my break. Because otherwise, I get engrossed in what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, it'll be the end of the day. And I realize I didn't take one break. So I use this. And these are great anxiety breaks right now. So I'll just pull one out. And this one says, step outside and breathe fresh air, there's being the breathing again. You know, just take grounding breaths. And I will do that. I have a, you know, if it's raining, I have a covered porch, I'll, I'll bundle up and I'll go out and I will just stand there and take in the fresh air. Or I have written, let's see the color, uh, go up and down the stairs three times. I put this one in there because I couldn't do this during my period of figuring out, I go and go through this health stuff, anxiety related health stuff and these diagnoses. It was hard for me to go up and down once but I've got it three times to kind of push myself. And if I'm feeling good, I'll jog it. If I'm not, I just walk it, but it's movement. It's getting me going. Movement is really important. Or um, a three minute mindfulness walk, whether it's through my house or outside. And in a mindfulness walk or a mindfulness moment, whether you're sitting or walking or doing whatever, you are holding your thoughts, you're reining them in, not fighting with them and not trying to control them, but you're using your senses to put that stuff in your mind instead of your anxious thoughts. What do you see, hear, feel, smell, even taste? You can mindful, mindfully eat and, and take in fully what your food tastes like. So my little jar here is filled with everything like that. Um, oh, that was stairs. Um, a, guide for a guided meditation. I have some guided meditations that I do and some are short and some are longer, but it's break. So if during this time, if you make, you can make it a hat, you can make it a jar, you can use slips of paper, you can use popsicle stick, craft sticks, whatever you want. Write down little things to do to take a break, to distract your mind. And set a timer once an hour, once every half hour, every, whatever works for you, pull one out and do that. Take that break and it resets your mind, it resets your body and helps you distance yourself from your anxiety that we talked about at the beginning, putting that distance between you and your thoughts with these activities. I love those. I'm going to do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope, I hope it, was, it was helpful to, to everybody. I, 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 I really do. I love them. I use them and it works wonders for me. It is. It, it's really great. And it's not something, you know, each of those is very doable, very quick, but could right. refresh you in the moment. Right. Yeah. Right. Because realistically, we can't, most of us cannot just take, oh, I'm going to take and do a, a, a one hour yoga program and then I'm going to uh, go for a walk for another hour. You, who can do that? And right. right now we can't get out. So a lot of these don't require going, going out other than stepping outside. So right, right. quick little things to do. 
So first of all, I want to thank Tanya. Her website is Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A, J, Peterson, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N.com. And I, I typed it here in the chat box. You could all see it. Our website, my organization is friendshealthconnection.org. And my direct email is admin at friendshealthconnection.org. I wanted to just add that someone once told me that life is like a pendulum. So often we're in the middle. And to me, the middle, when the pendulum is just set, it's we're living life. And if we could acknowledge the gratitude during that time, sometimes I think that's the best that it gets. That middle of the road, not, not too extreme left, not too extreme right, just enjoy life. Right now, unfortunately, the pendulum is in a really hard place but it will come back and swing. And when it comes back, I think for a while, it's gonna be better than ever. I think people, kids will be grateful to go to school. We'll be grateful just to step outside and hug each other. I think the world, I hope it'll be kinder and we could get back and really appreciate our normal things. And then hopefully we can return to the middle with a new sense of gratitude. So just know this is a difficult time for everyone. And I really hope that this webinar and others that we're doing will help. And I welcome your thoughts, requests, anything that we could do or offer to make your life a little easier. We have access to a lot of experts and I just wanna hear your thoughts on what could help you. And then Tanya, any final thoughts from you? Um, I wanna build on that pendulum thing that, that you said first quick. I love that. I hadn't heard that before, but it was very true things kind of swing in extremes, but settle down in the middle. But right now, you are right, the pendulum is, is, is out here over the top with anxiety and panic and unknowns and, and health worries and everything. But that pendulum, that, that pendulum in your external life, there's a lot of that that you don't have control over, that you know, we can't control. But think of your own life right now, right? This day and this moment as your own pendulum. And what can you do to kind of, when you're here, you know, or even when you're swinging over here and things are great, you still, you know, that it's, those are circumstances. What can you do? And hopefully some of the things we've talked about will help to keep your pendulum centered, despite that, that external pendulum that's swinging right now. What can you do in your moment, just moment by moment? It's a very, very step by step process and just keep reining it in. This is my moment right now. This is my in breath. This is my out breath. This is what I'm doing. This is my purpose. And my pendulum is right here. And for Anne, FaceTiming your grandson is a great thing you could do right now. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's neat. So if we could leverage the technology we do have right now, thank goodness we have it. And in that way, we're not isolated because we could see and hear each other. We could FaceTime. We could call. So that's really helpful. But I agree. What can we do now every day to kind of bring that stability back, especially when life is hard. It's resourcefulness. It's the tips that Tanya gave, the breathing exercises, the addressing our beliefs, and hopefully the information presented today will help you with that. So thank you to everyone who joined us. Tanya, thank you for everything that you do, for being here, for the books and information you constantly put out, for being you. And just, I appreciate everything that you said, all your expertise and wisdom. Thank you for oh, Thank you so much. And honestly, thank you. This has been great to be here. And I was just so ecstatic when you reached out and I was happy to do it and honored. And I love your, your website and your mission and the Friends Health Connection. I, check it out. It's really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And uh, visit us to learn more we're doing these regularly on all different topics during this time. I think anxiety is the first one that came to mind. <laughs> and, um, but we're doing others. And again, I welcome your thoughts and ideas. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Peace,